Hello guys, this is Vikram Singh Sanger, pursuing MBBS from GRM Gwalior, now presenting a beautiful lecture on the great topic that is the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Part 1 and this session is a bit longer but the concepts will be so clear as you have never watched before and you will definitely speak as Mazaya. So now guys, we will go for the inflammatory bowel disease and today we will go for the comparative study in between the Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So in the part one, we will first go for the anatomy of small and large intestine followed by the histology. Subsequently, we will discuss the etiology and risk factors of IBD and the pathogenesis and gross progression of IBD. And then we will discuss the clinical features and the extra intestinal features and the complications of IBD. So in the part one, we will discuss all such things. In the part two, we will discuss the diagnosis of IBD and in the part three, we will go for the management and surgery as well. So let's get started here. So guys, now we will go for the anatomy of small intestine and we have discussed the anatomy of duodenum in the peptic ulcer section. You can refer to that. But now we will go for the anatomy of jejunum and ileum. Okay. So first thing is the location of that. So that is the abdomen, right? And that is the chest here and that is the abdomen and jejunum is present at left upper quadrant. So that is present here, jejunum and the ileum is present at right lower quadrant. That is the ileum. So this is the location. Second thing is the walls. Okay. So the walls of jejunum is thicker and more vascular and the walls of the ileum, these are thinner and less vascular. Second thing is the lumen and the lumen of jejunum is wider and often empty. And the lumen of ileum that will be the narrower and more often it is loaded right and third thing is the mesentery now let us discuss the concept of mesentery here so that is the superior mesenteric artery right and this is the bowel loop here right and from the superior mesenteric artery the intestinal vessels okay these will be arised here and these will form the arcade here and that is the arcade and from this arcade, these straight vessels and that will be arised and will be supplying the loop of bowel here. Okay, these are the straight vessels or vasa recta. Okay, these are the vasa recta. These are the vessels which are erect, which are straight. Okay, and this is the arcade, the arc, and these are intestinal vessels here, right? That is supreme mesenteric artery. Okay, and in between the vasa recta, there is the window. That is the window. So in the case of jejunum, the very few one or two arcades are present and in the case of the ileum, the three or six arcades are present. So condition will be like that. Okay. In the case of the jejunum, right? So since the arcades are lesser, that's why the vasa recta will be longer. Okay. So vasa recta will be longer. And that is bowel loop of jejunum. And in the case of the ileum, the multiple arcades are present here. Okay. So multiple layers of arcades are present here. Okay, that's why the vasa recta will be shorter in the case of ileum and that is the loop of ileum here, right? So windows are shorter in the case of ileum and windows are longer in the case of the jejunum here and this is what is written here. Okay, vasa recta will be longer and that will be shorter here. Okay, this is the concept of the vessels and the arcades and the mesentery as well. So now we will discuss the circular mucosal fold here. Okay, so that is the loop of bowel. And we find there is multiple mucosal folds there. Grossly presented folds are there. And when we magnify one fold, we will find it is like that. Okay. So that is the one fold, second, third. And that is first, second, third. Right. And that is our loop of bowel. Okay. And when we find, when we magnify it further, we find there is multiple villi. Okay. So these are the villi. Okay, and these are the villi which are present over the plica circularis. That is plica circularis, and these are the villi. And when we further magnify these villi, we will find there is the epithelium, which are brush border epithelium. Okay, so that is the folds, and having the villi over these folds. So in the case of jejunum, there are the more closely set and larger folds are present. And in the case of ileum, we have smaller and sparse. And when we discuss the villi over the jejunum, we find there are leaf-like villi, right? These are leaf-like. And in the case of ileum, these are the finger-shaped villi. 
okay followed by the pears patches which are absent in the case of jejunum but these are present in the case of the ileum and subsequently the lymphatic follicles which are fewer in the jejunum and these are more numerous in the case of ileum so multiple lymphoid follicles are present here okay in the submucosa so in the case of submucosa these are present here that is what the small intestine and now we will compare the small and large intestine here so first thing is the appendices epiploicy and these are basically the fat globules which are present over the serosa and these are present in the case of the large intestine and which are absent in the case of small intestine so second thing is the tinea coli right and these are basically the longitudinal muscle which are present only in the colon and these are three in number right that is present in the large intestine and which is absent in the case of small intestine here and third thing is the circulations and these are basically formed by the contraction of tinea coli so these are the pouch like structures at the hostations and that is present in the case of colon only and absent in the case of small intestine right and third parameter is the distensibility and diameter and diameter is more in the case of large intestine and less diameter as well as less distensibility is present in the small intestine and next parameter is the fixity right and the greater part of small intestine is mobile and the greater part of colon that is a large intestine and this is the fixed here that is fixed and that is freely mobile in the case of small intestine subsequently the villi which are present in the small intestine absent in the large one and next parameter is the transverse mucosal folds which are permanent in the case of small intestine and these are getting obliterated when lm relaxes here subsequently the pears patches which are present in the ileum subsequently the small intestine is a residence of the intestinal worms typhoid bacilli and tubercle bacilli and the large intestine is a residence of antamoeba stylitica subsequently the dysentery organisms or shigella right and the carcinoma okay so carcinoma the colorectal carcinoma is more common here and now the effects of infection and irritation right so diarrhea is associated with the small intestine and the dysentery that is the bloody diarrhea that is associated with the large intestine so this is what the anatomy and now we will discuss the histology of the small and large intestine so number one thing is the jejunum right so let us just magnify that okay so number one thing is the epithelium of that right so this is the area of the mucosa that is the mucosa right and this is the area of submucosa that is submucosa here and this is the area of muscularis propria and that is the area of the serosa here so first we will discuss the mucosa right and mucosa is having the villi okay and these are leaf shaped so leaf shaped villi are present over the jejunum and this is the epithelium here and that is the epithelium which is brush bordered columnar epithelium right and this is the basement membrane of this epithelium right basement membrane and this is the lamina propria and that is having the lamina propria as well this whole area the central area and this area that is of lamina propria right and followed by this small layer this small layer that is of muscularis mucosae right this is the muscularis mucosae a small layer of smooth muscle cells right subsequently we will discuss the submucosa that is the area of submucosa here right that is submucosa and subsequently we will discuss the muscularis propria that is muscularis propria and that is having the circular muscle layer okay and that is the longitudinal muscle layer right so in between the longi and circular muscle layer we are just having the autonomic ganglia so these are the autonomic ganglia right and that is basically the orbac plexus or the myenteric plexus here okay so this is what the muscularis propria or muscularis externa and subsequently we have small layer of serosa here and that is of mesothelial cells and now we will go for the histology of ileum here so let us just magnify that right so this is the mucosa right so this whole area is of mucosa and subsequently that is submucosa here right mm -hmm. submucosa and this is the muscularis propria okay so number one layer is of mucosa and first thing is the villi and these are the finger shaped villi 
okay and that's having the brush border columnar epithelial cell layer and this is the basement membrane right and this central area is of lamina propria and lamina propria is present as well over here that is of lamina propria here and subsequently we have a small layer a thin layer of the smooth muscles that is basically the muscularis mucosae that is of muscularis mucosae right so this is what the mucosa and subsequently we will discuss the submucosa here right and more important thing is the lymphoid follicles right that is lymphoid follicles this is also a lymphoid follicle right and this is also a lymphoid follicle and we also find the pierce patches that is the aggregate of the lymphoid follicles found in the submucosa of the ileum as well okay so these are the lymphoid follicles and this is the muscularis propria here okay so this is what the histology of ileum and now we will discuss the histology of colon so this is the mucosa okay that is the mucosa of colon right the large intestine and subsequently this is our the submucosa that is the submucosa here right and followed by that is the muscularis propria or muscularis externa so first we are just having the discussion over the mucosa and mucosa doesn't have any type of villi and projections right so these are absent here villi are absent here right and we just having the goblet cells these are the goblet cells let me just further magnify that these are the goblet cells and these are the goblet cells and these are just having the mucus and which is washed during staining that's why they appear to be clear so this is what the mucosal cells and then we will discuss the submucosa here right so submucosa and in the case of submucosa we are not supposed to find any lymphoid follicle here and we just find the arterioles and blood supply in the submucosa and subsequently the muscularis propria or externa that is having cml and lml so now the arterial supply of bowel right the foregut is being supplied by celiac trunk subsequently the midgut portion that is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery and third one is the hind gut which is being supplied by inferior mesenteric artery so now guys we will discuss the etiology of and risk factors of ibd and we have five different domains five different factors which are interacting with each other and these are responsible for the pathogenesis of ibd so first factor is the genetic susceptibility right and we have different genes involved in this and first thing is the irgm right that is the immunity related gtpase m second thing is the atg 16l1 that is the autophagy 16 like 1 and now third one is the not 2 now it is known as card 15 but classic not 2 is the nucleotide oligomerization binding domain and this not 2 is found to be associated with the pathogenesis of crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and if this not 2 gene that is a gene right if not to gene is present over the ibd loci 1 at the long arm of 16 chromosome then alteration of this gene is responsible for the pathogenesis of crohn's disease right and this gene not to gene is present over the ibd 2 loci at the long arm of 12th chromosome is responsible for the pathogenesis right that is the first factor the so second function is the impaired mucosal barrier function and once the tight junctions are lost okay so normal organism present in the lumen can enter inside the gut wall and resulting into the inflammation so that is causing the ibd right and third thing is the defense in right the defect in the defense in molecules and these are required to prevent the invasion of the commensals and once it is defective there is the invasion of commensals leading to inflammation so that is second factor so second factor is the microbial flora of gut okay so measles virus and the mycobacterium para tuberculosis are found to be associated with the pathogenesis of crohn's disease since the virus is decreasing threshold for inflammation resulting into the inflammation there and the clostridium difficile and the campylobacter jejuni are found to be more associated with the pathogenesis of uc next factor is the environmental factor right first thing is the psychological factors such as the stress and anxiety and that alters the immunity and causing the response again the normal flora resulting into the inflammation and further pathogenesis right and the smoking as well and the diet as well 
right? So these are the environmental factors and subsequently there is the immune dysregulation, right? And there is the alteration of immune suppression, right? So there is more inflammation and defective immune response of innate and acquired immunity is one of the reasons for the pathogenesis of so interaction among these five factors are resulting into the pathogenesis, the onset of pathogenesis of IBD. Right. So now we will discuss the pathogenesis of IBD here. Right. That is the organism, the microorganism. Right. That is present in the lumen. Right. And that is the M cells. Right. And these are the normal epithelial cells, normal epithelial cells. And that is the M cells. And M cells are modified epithelial cells, which are just used to capture the microorganisms. Right. That is being captured by M cells. And since this bacteria, this microorganisms is so nasty as that kills this M cell and enters inside the gut wall, right? So this is the bacteria here. And once it is finding any abnormal organism, that is the bacteria that undergoes the phagocytosis, right? That is being phagocytosed by macrophages. And once it is uh, phagocytosed, the antigens, that is the antigen of bacteria that is being processed and that is being presented over the surface of macrophage and it is found to be associated with the MHC class 2 molecules, right? So that is the MHC class 2 molecule here, right? And that is the antigen of bacteria, right? And once it is phagocytosed and processed and presented, that will be resulting into the presentation of this bacteria over the MHC class 2 molecules. And now this macrophage is able to present this uh, MHC class 2 molecule along with the processed antigen to the T cells. So that is the T helper cell here, right? And that is the antigen that is carried by our MHC class 2 molecule. That is our MHC class 2 molecule, right? And this is having the processed antigen. And this antigen, this is star antigen that is binding with the TCR, that is the T cell receptor. This T cell is having its own receptor that is TCR, right? And the antigen is binding with the TCR and MHC class 2 molecules are supposed to bind with the CD4 molecules of T cells. So T cells are having the CD4 molecules which are binding with the MHC class 2 molecules. So this is the primary interaction between the antigen presenting cell that is the APC. Right, that is the antigen presenting cell which is presenting the processed antigen to the T helper cell here. So we have done with the primary interaction and now we will see the secondary interaction and secondary interaction is the one that is able to make different types of the helper cells depending upon which interleukin is being released by the APC. So we have basically four types of different interleukins which are making different types of T helper cells. So now these are what the four different antigen presenting cells, right? And these are four different T helper cells, right? And once the primary interaction, that is the primary interaction is done. And now the secondary interaction will occur. And depending upon which interleukin is released from antigen presenting cells, that decides which type of T helper cells it will be formed, right? So for example, this is primary interaction and secondary interaction that releases interleukin 4, right? So in the activity of interleukin 4, this T helper cells is converted into T helper cell type 2. And if after primary interaction, if APC releases the interleukin 12, interleukin 12, that is converted into TH1 cells, right? And if that is releasing interleukin 1 beta, that is resulting into the formation of T helper 17. Right. And fourth thing is, if it is releasing interleukin 2, that is T helper regulatory cells, regulatory cells are formed. So we will not discuss the regulatory cells here. We will discuss all three cells here, right, which are involved in the pathogenesis of the Crohn's disease. Okay. And ulcerative colitis as well. And now we will discuss these three cells here, right. So these are these three cells, T helper 1, T helper 2 and T helper 17 and this T helper 1 cell is releasing the interferon gamma and TNF alpha right and that is activating the macrophages so macrophage activation is there and that will be resulting into the granuloma formation right so 
so granuloma is being formed and that is what is being seen in the case of Crohn's disease that granuloma are formed here. Second one is the T helper 2 cell and that releases interleukin 4, interleukin 5 and that is activating the eosinophils and the plasma cells and the plasma cells have in the cartwheel nuclei and these are predominant the Golgi complex here and resulting into the formation of antibody right antibody formation and that is responsible for humoral immunity and that is causing the cell mediated immunity right immunity right so this is what the two steps third one is the T helper 17 cells right and these are activating the neutrophils okay so neutrophilic infiltration is present so now guys we will discuss the progression the gross progression of IBD so first we will discuss the Crohn's disease okay so we have made the four villi here right the four villi are being formed up here right and this is mucosa submucosa and this is the muscularis propria right and this layer is of serosa right and the first presentation is the skip lesions okay so skip lesions are formed up here the transmural and skip lesions right so this is the skipped area that is also skipped area right and that is involved and that is involved as well so um, as we know the inflammation is going on and resulting into the ulcer formation okay so this is the ulcer which is formed over the mucosa of the bowel here so that is the ulcer and as we know first presentation is the aphthous ulceration so aphthous ulcers are formed here right number one okay so as we see these ulcers over the top view we find there is the dots are being formed here these are dots in the form of dots these are present okay and second step is the serpentine ulcers okay so serpentine ulcers okay so these are just just like serpentine okay the snake like ulcers are formed here right these are the ulcers right and this is the skipped area skipped area and skipped area right and this central area and that is basically an involved area an area having the lesions in the form of serpentine ulcers and in between these ulcers serpentine ulcers there is the swollen up mucosa the mucosa is being swollen up or erythematous mucosa right so what is this appearance called so this is the erythematous mucosa and showing the cobblestone appearance so cobblestone appearance is there cobblestone appearance is there second step of pathogenesis third one is as disease progresses these ulcers become more deep here okay and these ulcers are becoming more deep and in some mucosa we just having the blood supply okay so this is what is being eroded here so as the ulcers are becoming more deeper okay so that is involving these blood vessels and these are getting eroded resulting into the bloody diarrhea is there right so this is what is causing the hematochezia okay hematochezia or bloody diarrhea is there and the fresh blood in stool right that is second step and subsequently these ulcers are becoming more deeper and that is reached up to the muscularis propria and once ulcers are being reached up to the muscularis propria and that is called as the fissures right and that is causing the fissure formation here so third step of pathogenesis is a fissure formation right that is third step right subsequently these ulcers are becoming more deeper okay and that is reached up to serosa so serosa is becoming more sticky and that can adhere with another bubble loop that can adhere with the ureter okay causing the obstruction of bubble loop and ureter okay so that is what is the another step and subsequently that can form the fissula right the fissula can be formed the well formed epithelized tract can be formed with the vagina with the skin and with the another bubble loop so transmural involvement are present in the case of Crohn's disease and the skip lesions are present here okay and whatever the area is involved is having the transmural involvement right so this is what the presentation and as we know the granulomas are formed here so because of the granuloma this area is being so distracted so distorted as the chronic inflammation is going on and resulting into the structure formation is there so a structure is being formed up here structure is a formed okay so this is what the basic pathogenesis and now we will discuss the pathogenesis in correspondence with the radiology right number one thing is the aphthous ulcers 
okay and these are presenting the target sign right a bull's eye sign bull's eye sign right the target sign here the second one is the serpentine ulcers and which are forming the cobblestone appearance of mucosa so cobblestone appearance are there right and third thing is the fissures and fissures are forming the rose thorn appearance right so these are the fissures that is forming the rose thorn appearance right rose thorn appearance right and strictures and we have discussed about the strictures and strictures will form the string sign of cantor here okay this is what the radiology and apart from that that is causing the fat to be adhere right so that is causing the creepy fat sign here okay so creeping fat sign is there and apart from that that is dilating the vasa recta so vasa recta are being supplied at this mesenteric position and that is causing dilatation of vasa recta resulting into the com sign so that is looking like a com the strings of com okay so com signs are there okay so this is what the pathogenesis and now we will discuss the pathogenesis of ulcerative colitis here so these are not villi but these are normal mucosal folds are there since the colon is involved more commonly that's why the villi are not present here right this is normal mucosa and sub mucosa muscularis externa and serosa here right this is what the ulcers which are superficial but these ulcers are the continuous involving the whole part of colon there and this is what the blood supply in sub mucosa right and these are the ulcers these are the ulcers okay and these are basically the broad base ulcers these are the broad base ulcers okay which are showing the collar button sign okay the collar button sign in the radiology the collar button sign in the radiology okay so these ulcers are superficial but these can erode these blood vessels and these are running horizontally right so these blood vessels are eroded since the extensive blood vessels are involved that's why massive flow of blood number 1 number 2 is superficial ulcers which are continuous in nature are present here so these are not involving the muscularis propria and serosa rather these are present in the mucosa and sub mucosa right so these are what the superficial but continuous ulcers initially they was the broad base ulcers but subsequently involving the blood vessels resulting into the massive flow of blood and the frequency of stool passing the bloody stools is the more than 6 and more than 10 sometimes so now we will discuss the clinical features of ibd number one is the crohn's disease okay and the first feature is the intermittent colicky pain and when the food obstructs inside the strictures resulting into the excessive peristalsis resulting into crampy and the colicky pain number one feature number two is the malabsorption syndrome resulting into the diarrhea since nothing is being absorbed that's why everything is being lost in the diarrhea resulting into the diarrhea third one is the hematochezia since blood vessels are involved resulting into the hematochezia next one is the fistula formation the sticky serosa can adjoin with the surrounding structures such as the skin the antero cutaneous fistula and that can adjoin with the vesicle or bladder resulting into antero vesicular fistula the antero vaginal fistula and so on right next one is the abscess formation right so there can be pus collection resulting into the abscess formation next one is the bowel obstruction since the sticky serosa can adjoin with the surrounding structures such as ureter and the another bowel loops resulting into the obstruction of subsequent structures so next one is the peritonitis right that is causing the inflammation of serosa resulting into inflammation of mesentery and that is the part of peritoneum resulting into the peritonitis there next one is the adhesions sticky serosa can adhere with the different surrounding structures resulting into the obstruction and fissure formation the transmural ulceration resulting into fissure formation and fever since it is chronic disease resulting into the anemia and causing the pallor right and the fever can be there and since the malabsorption is there that's why that is causing the weight loss and now we will discuss the clinical features of uc number one is the diarrhea the bloody diarrhea and bloody dysentery right and uh, frequency can be more than 6 per day right first one is and second one is the rectal bleeding and third one is tenesmus the sensation of incomplete evacuation of bowel that is tenesmus followed by 
passage of mucus. Mucus is being passed up here and the crampy abdominal pain as well and subsequently the pallor because of the anemia component, right? And since the massive blood is being lost, that's why the plasma proteins are being lost as well, resulting into the decrease in the blood colloidal osmotic pressure, resulting into edema and the puffy eyes can be there. And because of the primary sclerosing cholangitis, that will be resulting into the obstruction of bile duct, resulting into the obstructive jaundice and the pruritus because of the bile salts. Right. Subsequently, we have the fever and the weight loss. That is non-specific symptoms. And this is what the features and now we will discuss the extra intestinal manifestations. Right. So in the case of Crohn's disease, skin involvement is there. Okay. In the skin, we have erythema nodosum, erythema multiforme and the pyoderma gangrenosum that is found to be more commonly associated with the UC. Right. So in the case of pancreas, we have pancreatitis. And in the case of kidney, we have nephrotic syndromes. In the case of eye, we have iritis, uveitis and the conjunctivitis. Right. In the case of liver, we have non-specific trialitis. Right. Subsequently, we have the primary sclerosing cholangitis and the obstruction of bile duct resulting into the obstructive jaundice. Subsequently, we have cholesterol gallstones and in the case of urological involvement, we have the ureteral obstruction because of the adhesions, right? And subsequently, we have the enterovesical fistula because the sticky serosa can adhere with the bladder resulting into the fistula formation, right? And we have the oxalate stones, right? And we have the secondary amylorosis. Now we will discuss the blood picture and that is having the anemia and that is also having thrombocytosis, right? And subsequently in the case of joint environments, we have the ankylosing spondylitis is having HLA B27 positivity and we have peripheral arthritis. And now we will discuss same thing of ulcerative colitis here. So in the case of joint involvement, we have the ankylosing spondylitis and the migratory, migratory arthritis is there. Right. And these are having HLA B27 association. This is the first thing. Second thing is skin involvement. And we have pyoderma gangrenosum more commonly followed by the erythema nodosum here. This is what the skin involvement. And now we will go for the bile duct involvement. And then we find the primary sclerosing cholangitis is more commonly found to be associated with the UC resulting into the obstructive jaundice. Now guys, we will discuss the complications of IBD. First thing is the complications of CD. Okay. And the first complication is the iron deficiency anemia is there because of the malabsorption that results into the iron deficiency anemia. Subsequently, there is the malabsorption. Subsequently, we have the stricture formation. That is basically the root cause of the string sign of Cantor in the radiology. Subsequently, we have the different fistula are being formed up here. And then we have the peritoneal abscess and the gut perforation. Since there is the transmural involvement of gut resulting into the gut perforation and the peritonitis as well. And then we have the hematochasia, this blood in the stools and subsequently we have the adhesions because of the sticky serosa and that is able to stick with the different and that is able to adhere with the different structures present in the vicinity resulting into the obstruction of ureter and the bowel as well. Okay, subsequently we have the increased risk of getting the carcinoma of colon and then we have the secondary amyloidosis. So now guys we will discuss the complications of UC. Number one complication is the toxic megacolon which is the surgical emergency. Right, subsequently we have increased risk of getting the colorectal carcinoma. Third complication is the hemorrhage, right, and the hematochasia as well. So next complication is the edema and anasarca. Since due to the heavy flow of blood in the defecation resulting into the decrease in serum albumin and the blood collateral osmotic pressure is being decreased and resulting into the edema and the generalized edema and the anasarca, right. And subsequently we have anemia, right. This is because of the massive flow of blood and the anemia of chronic disease as well. And then we have electrolyte disbalance and then subsequently we have the hematochasia and these are what the complications of the inflammatory bowel disease and thank you for watching so guys if you're just having any doubt and query you can go for the comment section below hit the like button for the sake of the integration and don't forget to subscribe pressing the bell icon will give me some why so guys we will meet at the another section of disease that is the ibd part 2 so till then keep integrating thank you